How you guys doing? Good? Woo! I am excited to be here. Man, that was powerful and amazing. Um, for those that don't know, me and my family, we live in Maui, Hawaii, which is awesome, and we love it, and it's incredible. Shout out, someone came from there? Okay. I think there's someone from every state except Vermont. Come on, Vermont. Who's the Hawaii person? We got some Hawaii people? Hawaii people? You're not here? You want to be quiet? Okay, thank you. I love you. Um, trying to represent and got owned right there. Um, very excited to be here, but what I was going to say is how incredible this is to see something like this and how powerful it is because, man, in Maui, it's a little bit of like a small town, small island, and so I think our mega church, and I mean like the one that does the VBS, the one that does the events, the one that does the conferences, I think is probably like this big right here, this section, so appreciate you guys, by the way. So it's just incredible to be in a room with this, thousands of young people, worshiping, loving the Lord, opening up the scriptures, it's really amazing. So if you have your Bible, Genesis 2. Genesis 2, if you were here on the porch on a Tuesday, yes, I was in Genesis 1, so maybe in the next 900 years while I visit, we can maybe get through the whole Bible together. Um, and the same problem is happening where, as I told you, my two-year-old ripped my Genesis 1 and 2, so hopefully I can read it okay. Like I said, hopefully, I don't know why she hates the scriptures, but anyways, um, I'm excited to be with you guys. Now, I have a very big task today, um, self-imposed, I guess. But I want to basically summarize the entire scriptures for you in the next 30 minutes. Can we do that? Can we buckle up and get ready? So here's the reason. I believe that so many of us, specifically in the Western evangelical church, we're very good at memorizing verses. We're very good at tattooing them on our wrists. Anyone else got the cliche Greek? Okay, me too. We're very good at the micro. We're not very good at the macro. There's something about the, the, the like I would say another way to put it is we're malnourished. We have a missing nutrient and that's the story of God. Beginning to end, God is doing something, and there's something powerful about that. When you understand the meta narrative, which is a big theological term for it, when you understand that, I think it does something deeply to you and your walk and how you live in your city, how you treat money, how you're in relationships. There's something about the big story of God that is deeply compelling, and we can find ourselves in it, but we have to understand it. So I'm going to try to just blaze through that, try to trace some big benchmarks, and we'll go from there. Now, I'm going I'm to do this with one question. Okay, and I'm gonna try to trace this big story with one question or one premise. And that is, what does God want from us? What does God want from us? Or another way to put it is, what is God after? I think there's multiple answers to that question, by the way. I don't think I'm just gonna give you one answer that's the, the say all be all. But I do think I wanna talk about one of them. And I think what God is after is a word that I'm just gonna say one word, and that is intimacy. So if you're taking notes, write down intimacy. I think God is a God who is on, in pursuit of us in the garden mandate he gave us in Genesis to know us and be known by us, okay? He doesn't need us, but he wants us. I know it's a weird way to think about it, but God has wants and desires. He has a person, is he not? There's three persons in the Trinity. And so he has wants and his desires, and so I think we do have to ask ourselves, according to the scriptures, like David talked about, this is our beacon, this is our North Star. What does God want from us? What is that story? Because let me just say, too, by the way, if you're not saturated and entrenched in the story of God, you will be captured by another story you will be captured by another story because here's another way to put it. We are story creatures, meaning a story has to live inside of us. It's impossible to be a human without a story. It's impossible. And when I say that, I mean just, again, the meta narrative. The, the, another way, another term for it is the telos, this vision, this aim of our life. What are we going after? Why are we here? What's the point? All these big questions, even if we're not explicitly answering them, we are, there's, like a, there's almost like a, a clicking, uh, a ticking clock inside of us pushing us towards our telos that we think is correct. Now, all of them are wrong, except if we align with what it means to be human as an image bearer of God in pursuit of him, being known by him and knowing him. So if you don't know that story, then you are captured by something else right now. We're all captured by a story. Let it be the right one because all the other stories lead to destruction and death and decay and erosion in our hearts and our relationships in our city. So if you have Genesis 2, we're gonna try to answer that question. If you have it open, what does God want from us? Let's go down to verse 15. The Lord God took the man... And he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Oh, how'd you guys do that so fast? I didn't even tell you I was gonna read this text. You guys are amazing. Okay. <laughs> Watermark production is like ninjas, are they not? Like, it's like, guys, like, how'd you do that? Okay. And, the, and it's all fancy? Oh, man. And the Lord, okay, where was I? Verse 16. Okay, like I said, we don't see this where I'm from. Okay. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat it, you shall surely die. Okay, God creates these image bearers, these royal priests, these, these divine representatives of him to reign and rule with him, by the way. What an amazing picture, by the way, what it means to be human. 
You're called to reign and rule alongside the creator of the universe, and he has said that so. Anything lesser than that is too small. Anything lesser than that is too small. Reign and rule alongside with your creator. That's the, that's the call. That's the command. And while he sets them in to do this job, he kind of gives them a couple little rules, a couple little um, pointers. And he says, everything in this garden is yours, which by the way, it takes a little Hebrew to unpack this, but when it says, you may surely eat of everything in the garden, that word eat in Hebrew is like redundant. It's actually almost saying it twice. It's like saying, you shall eat, 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 eat. Like basically he's just saying, everything is yours. But when he says, you should not touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that's singular. By the way, do we not reverse that in our vision of God a lot of times? God's always saying, no, 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 maybe a little yes. Do you have the right picture of God informed by the scriptures? Because according to this God, he is saying it's all yours. You can even go in Luke 15 when, this, when the father is trying to play the picture of God as well. And he says, everything that is mine is what? Yours. Do you have a stingy, crappy view of God? Can I say crappy in Dallas? Too late. Okay. Um, <laughs> trying to, you know, cultural context. Okay. Do you have a stingy, terrible, small view of God? Or do you have a God who is lavish? who wants you to eat, who wants you to delight, who wants you to celebrate with restrictions, by the way. I'm not saying those aren't in there. That's obviously there like we just read. Within his boundaries, within his markers, within how he's lined it up to work, he wants you to delight and celebrate and be blessed in his goodness. That's why it's so amazing to follow Jesus because he actually wants to fill us with the most joy and it's only possible through him. But let's look at that command. You may surely eat of every tree of the garden of, the, of evil or garden of Eden, but you may surely not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, now back up. So they were just given a very big job to do, right? Go create and subdue and reign and rule with God. One little pro tip here is a lot of us, we think we read Genesis and we think the whole earth was just like perfect and beautiful and amazing. That's not really what the story is trying to say. The story is almost like a prototype was created. God created this little pocket called the Garden of Eden. He created order out of chaos. He created beauty. He created goodness. He puts the image bearers in it. And then he says, look around. Now go make the rest of the world look like this. Are you tracking? That was the job. The job was, hey, here's a prototype. Pay attention. Now go make everything else look like this. We're still doing that job today, are we not? Again, to go subdue, to reign, and rule. So he gives them that job. Now, can we just agree that's a semi-big job? Go make the rest of the world look like Eden? So I don't know about you, but this command seems a little strange to me because when I read that, what's one thing you would probably need to go do a job that massive? What? It's not a trick question. We just read it. You'd probably need the knowledge of good and evil, Right? Or another way to put it is you just probably need to know what's right and wrong. You would know how to, you need to know how to operate. But I remember growing up too in some church context and I always heard this command and I always thought it was like an eternal cat and mouse game. Anyone else? Or like is God just kind of trying to bait and switch them? Is this kind of like, another way to put it is my, I don't ever play God by the way, it's, it never ends well in your brain. But when I was like, well, if I was God, right? This is me as like eight years old or something. I was like, well, if he didn't want him to touch the tree, then what's the obvious solution? Don't put it there. Don't put it there. Why is it there? Right? Unless, unless it's not arbitrary, it's actually for a reason. Might it be that that command from the very first page of scripture is God inviting us into intimacy, right? See, if they don't eat of that tree, if they don't eat of it, it's not a trick question, by the way, what do they not have in and of themselves? The knowledge of good and evil. Okay, so now if you're the humans tasked with this massive job, you don't in and of yourselves have the knowledge of good and evil, where are you going to find it? God, right? Anytime you're in a church setting, you get asked a question, just say God or Jesus, you'll be right. And if you're not, then like you're just like, well, I'm more holy. I said Jesus, okay? It's actually, it's not arbitrary. This command from page one is not arbitrary. It's God setting this tone or these two paths and inviting us to intimacy. It's God from page one saying, I want to walk with you and I want you to lean so heavily on me in faith and trust and dependence that you come to me for what is right and wrong, that I infuse in our deepest part of our relationship an actual spirit in you that informs you about what decisions you should make, how you should go about doing this, and how you can do the job. So it's an invitation or it's a fork in the road from page one saying, you can follow God, how you were created to operate and work and live under his design, or you can do it yourself, it never ends well. You can be the king of your own life, you can say you know how sex works better. You can say you know how money works better. You can say you know how relationships work better. It does not end well. Spoiler alert, Genesis 3. We'll get there in a second, okay? It does not end well, but it's a call to intimacy from page one. So I want us to start there, and then we'll keep going, okay? So he invites him into this, this vision of, I want you to be co-creators and collaborators and laborers with me as your king 
underneath me, commissioned out to be image bearers, but don't touch this tree because I want it to be in relationship with you. I don't want you to be able to do it without me. But, uh, spoiler alert, did they eat or not eat? They ate. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And again, so many of us, that's the path maybe we're on right now. I know better. And some of us, we need a season to totally play that out, do we not? Some of us, we don't wanna pay attention until that just ends in the dumps. Until that just ends in a place of us feeling so eroded, so corroded in our souls, so at a place of, man, this does not end well. But by the way, Jesus is there to meet you, is he not? Every time, every time. And so there's this invitation, they eat the tree, and then in a second, everything fractures. Their humanness, the, the world, their relationship with God, everything breaks. Sin is like a disease that comes in and breaks and fractures every part. Our relationship with God, our relationship to the earth, and our relationship to ourselves, and our relationship to each other. It breaks everything. Now, this is a fun little trivia for you. It says immediately after they, God kind of puts some curses and says some things and talks, you know, it gets a little serious. And then he kicks them out a particular direction in the garden. Do you know what direction that is? It's not a true question. There's only four options, right? North, west, south, and east. Yes, anyone? It's a famous Steinbeck novel. I haven't read it. I went to public school, but I heard it's good. What is it? East, there we go, east of Eden. It says he kicks them out east. Now, why is this important? Because that's actually a breadcrumb that keeps going in the scriptures farther and farther down the road. The next chapter, Lot, I mean, sorry, Cain kills his brother Abel. What direction does it says he kicked him out? I mean, banished him. East, Lot departs from Abraham the minute they have a little bit of tension and it's clearly he's the choice of disobedience in that story. What direction does he go? East, you get to Genesis 11, the peak story of all human pride and rebellion. We can, not, it's like the collective version of Genesis 3. We can do it on our own. We can build a tower to heaven. We can do it ourselves. And it says they migrated where? The east. It's as if East, according to the writer of Genesis, is almost this metaphor of this picture of what it looks to spiral downwards and away from intimacy with your creator, from the garden, from walking with him, from being with him. East, if we continue to make those choices, it just gets worse and worse and worse, and we keep going the same direction. Now, right after Tower of Babel, we meet a fun figure named who? Abram, Abram, and then Abraham. He takes up a lot more of the Bible, but he's one of these first figures where he gets called by God and he says yes to the relationship. He says yes to his way of how it's going to line up and he trusts him, he has faith and dependency, which again is the heart of intimacy. And by the way, when it says he calls Abraham, what direction does Abraham go? West. He's going back towards the garden, the place that God wanted to walk with his people. And I nerd out on this stuff, so there's a lot more, but I'll give you one or two more. I think later down in the Torah, when God is giving Moses instructions to how to build the tabernacle, which by the way, the tabernacle is, he specifically gives him instructions to say, put a bunch of fruit in there, put a bunch of, you know, like uh, statues of animals, put a bunch of trees and foliage. What is he trying to represent the tabernacle as? The Garden of Eden, right? And he says specifically put the entrance to the temple on the east side of the temple, so when you're walking in, you're going what direction? West back towards meeting with God. It's as if God, from the very page of scripture all the way down even through the curse, is saying, I want to call you back. Stop going east. Stop thinking you can do it on your own. He wants to call us back and he's continually calling us back. And so this first stage of the Bible is kind of what we talked about and it goes all the way to the end of the first five books of the Bible, which is what we call the Torah. Can you guys say Torah? Torah. Torah. Or if you're really saying it in Hebrew, you can kind of say it with a loogie, just don't spit on the person in front of you. Torah, you know, cough on someone, and especially now, that's dangerous. Okay. Um, whew, never mind, don't do that. Uh, the first five books of the Bible are kind of seen as this foundational, these, these, these pillars, documents to the, the people of Israel, to the community, both for ethics and government and politics, but also the way to live and sexuality. It was kind of this full encompassing, this is how to live, this is how to be human for the early ancient Near East people of Israel. Okay, and the nation of God that God called them in that, in the, the promise of Abraham. Now, the Torah kind of has its own little thesis, right? What starts to show up later in the books is this common way that God begins to relate to his people in a particular covenant. It's the Mosaic covenant, right? And God, hundreds of times in, in the Torah, by the way, says this thing where he basically goes, uh, this is essentially me summarizing the, Torah, the, the Mosaic covenant. If you do X, I will what? Starts with a B. Bless you. And if you don't do X, I will do what? Starts with a C curse you. And so hundreds of times, this kind of this, this formula almost starts to play out in Torah, where God is saying, if you live this way, if you do what I've asked you, if you live in this way, if you treat sexuality this way, money this way, etc., I will bless you. It'll go well for you. By the way, that's a fun phrase I'm saying to my kids a hundred times a day. If you do this, it'll go well for you. <laughs> Please do not, not do this, okay? And if you don't, 
I will curse you. Now, a curse, again, we think of that as some really, something really serious. It's really serious, but it's, it's, it's you, you will live with the ramifications of that decision. It will erode itself, right? It will not go well for you. Now, we hear the Mosaic Covenant, and a lot of us, especially if we're in kind of a Western evangelical context, a lot of us cringe, right? Because that sounds just like super law, right? We're like, oh, that just sounds like, you know, no grace. It sounds like you got to earn your way to heaven, etc. cetera. No, we are certainly outside of that covenant, and I'm going to get to that, that in a minute. But can we just agree? God would never give something to his people that was not for their good, right? So what's going on there? I think a lot of us, we fumble with the law. We don't know exactly what's going on. Um, what, I, what I would say is this, is it's actually not God arbitrarily, you know, not doing grace, but it's actually a way in which he's trying to relate to his people to lead them to intimacy, okay? Now, I know that's hard to, hard to think about. I'll, I'll, an illustration I think about is um, all of us were raised on Torah obedience, were we not, early on? Early on? Like, like so I, I have a couple children. I think they're even here. They were here earlier. Um, you never know. They probably cried and they got a bounce. They only last for five minutes. Um, but our youngest right now, like, right? So the earliest times I can remember myself or also even administering kind of Torah obedience, like, hey, if you go well, I'll bless you. You get a Skittle, you get a Snickers, you get a little candy, you get a cookie, whatever. And if you don't, I'll curse you. You don't get that, All right? That's essentially what it is. The earliest time I can remember that is, you know, like um, right now we're doing it. It's like potty training, coming when we say come and, you know, listening when we say no. Now, that is actually meant to, that's normal and fine, meaning like that's actually normal at that age. But where it becomes weird is if Torah obedience is the point the whole time. Track with me here. So let's say Lucy, our two-year-old, that's fine and normal now to say, hey, if you go to the bathroom, or if you go potty, you get a Skittle. Here you go, right? That's normal. And maybe if you're not a parent, you're like, that's still weird. Okay. Um, but let's say she's like, I don't know, 16 or something and coming home from a weekend or something with friends or something like that. And we go, hey, little Lucy, if you go potty, I'll give you a Skittle. You'd be like, that's weird. That's weird. Now, did anything change that I said to her at two that I did at 16? No, that's the problem. That's the problem, right? At two, Torah obedience is actually how you lead someone to what? To intimacy, right? When someone is older, when they're 16, when they're 18, when they're a young adult and you no longer have them under the authority of your home, they are maybe obeying or honoring you is another way to put it, out of the love of the relationship. And hopefully they're going to the bathroom on their own without Skittles as well right? But whether it's just like honoring you and how they talk to you or whatever it is, Torah obedience is not there anymore. It's meant to push. It's, it's, like, it's like a push to intimacy. Are you tracking? That's actually why God started to get so upset at Israel because they just wanted to stay there. He's like, you're not getting the point. You're not getting the point. I want to take you farther. I want to take you deeper. I want to lead you to intimacy, and by the way, there's even little breadcrumbs in the Torah as well, where it's very obvious, even with Moses dying outside the promised land, that obviously like this mechanism cannot be the entire thing. Something greater has to happen. It's ne it never fully gets to the place of what it's trying to go for. And as it says later in the New Testament, it's not the problem with the law, it's the problem with us. We want to stay in it. We actually like it. We want to be two-year-olds forever. God wants to actually take you into full Intimacy. So then you go from Torah to the rest of the Tanakh, which is another Hebrew word for the rest of the scriptures, essentially. Okay? And then this is where it gets interesting. Because then you start to see all these books and all these writers start to wrestle with this dynamic problem we're kind of talking about right now. Which, by the way, can I just say, one of the things that really bothers me is when we read our Bible, we kind of read it flat. Like we read it like an instruction manual. Again, it's a story. It has an arc. The authors are talking to each other. They're wrestling with problems. They're wrestling with what's going on. They're wrestling with the tradition. So you get something like Psalm 51, where David just committed adultery and then had the guy murdered to cover it up, decently sized sin, not like I'm ranking him or anything, but pretty large. And in Psalm 51, it's his Psalm of repentance. And what does he say? He gets down to the bottom of that Psalm and he says, God, in his apology, in his repentance to God, if you wanted burnt offerings and sacrifices, Yahweh, I would give them to you. But what you truly want is what? depending on your translation, a broken and contrite heart. Now that sounds cute, put it on a coffee cup, but why is that actually very weird? Why is that weird? God, if you wanted burnt offerings and sacrifices, I would give them to you, why, is that, why, like, why does that make no sense? That's exactly what God commanded. Is it not? Where? In the Torah. But it's as if David is a living human being who understands what? That the Torah is actually taking us and pushing us somewhere. And so in this point in the story, he's realizing this problem of like, God, this is not ultimately what you want. This is meant to push to something greater. And what you truly want is he says it, 
a broken and contrite heart. It's almost saying like, God, if you wanted Torah, I would give it to you. But what you truly want is intimacy. If you wanted Torah, I would give it to you, but what you want is intimacy. This is all over, by the way, in the rest of the Hebrew scriptures. Job, same thing. Job, the book of Job opens with him giving sacrifices for sins his children might commit in the future. Is anyone that holy? Not me. Like he's guessing what sins they'll give. And he's like, I'm just gonna be so Torah obedient, I'm gonna kind of get in the DeLorean, go in the future, you know what I mean? Back to the future, shout out. Okay, uh, favorite movie of all time. Don't need to get into it, I nerd out. Anyways, the third one was sucked. Okay. Where was I at? Job, that's right, Job. So Job, okay, so he starts giving like, he starts sacrificing for sins his kids might commit. That's, that's the, what I'm trying to say is that's the epitome of Torah obedience. The epitome. But yet through the trials, through the wrestling, through all of the, 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 the boils and the diseases and all the hard stuff and deaths and just a brutal suffering life, he starts to begin to realize what? Oh, God does not relate to me in Torah obedience. God is not trying to talk to me or commune with me in Torah obedience. And so you get to the end of the book and it kind of has this Job prayer where he's kind of like reflecting again on everything that had just happened. And he says at the very end, he basically said, my whole life, God, I have what? I have heard you. I have heard of you. And then it goes into the next verse. But today for the first time, I what? See you. Again, for my, my whole life, I've heard of you. I've heard of the rules. I've heard of the things. I've heard of all the Christian stuff I have to do. But for my first time in my life, through all of this, you have met me. You have met me. I see you. That's intimacy. God wants that for you. He wants that for you. He wants to meet you today. Whether you love the Lord now or you've never even become a Christian, today he wants to go deeper with you. He wants to go deeper with you. Micah 6, 8, I'll read one last one for time's sake. Even my even Bible, by the way, like my subtitle on, the, on this text is even the question that we just asked in Genesis. You probably can't see this, but it says, what does the Lord require? That's, you know, not scripture because that's the, you know, the translators putting that there, but it's what does the Lord require? And then Micah 6, 8, wrestling with this same problem because it's a dynamic problem that they're trying to wrestle with. Man, this can't be it. it says this. Verse six, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Uh-oh. Um, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with 10,000s of rivers of oil? Or shall I give my firstborn for the transgression of my sin or the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? So he's saying just, man, if, if God wants one calf, why not give a thousand? Then it will be extra holy. He's just drawing everything out to its logical conclusion, right? If God wants this, then make it more pure. If God wants this, then make it more Verse eight, he pivots. No, he has told you, O man, what is truly good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. Again, Torah, Torah, Torah. No, 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 walking, intimacy. Walking, by the way, in the whole scriptures is just a euphemism for connection and relationship with God. All the people who were giants in the face said they walked with God. Intimacy. God is calling us to this place. Now, Again, this part in the story, what's fascinating is you start to see all these writers wrestle with the problem, but they know the solution's not here yet. Are you tracking? So they're kind of saying like, ah, I, I feel pushed in by this side of this is not all that God wants for us. God has to do something greater and deeper, but then pushed in by this side of it's not happening yet. It's not here yet. You see Jeremiah and Ezekiel and the prophets wrestle with this problem and say a new covenant has to happen, a new thing. God has to do a new thing. And then we get to the very end of the Old Testament and we open up what act of the play? The New Testament, which who shows up? Again, I gave you the tip. Any question? Who do you say? Jesus. Jesus shows up. And right from the very first moment, it's this explosion of God actually putting on human flesh to walk with us. Think about the intimacy there. John chapter one says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt in Greek is the word tabernacle. He tabernacled among us. He pitched his tent in your backyard. That's my translation, okay? <laughs> he pitched his tent among you. Whatever, whatever crap you're going through, whether it's something done against you, whether it's something you've done, whatever the shame you're feeling, do you believe that God is right next to you in a tent? He's camping with you. You are not alone. The question is, have you reached out to him? Are you dwelling with him? Are you talking with him? Are you communion with him? You are not alone. I want you to hear that in whatever you are going through. And again, Jesus himself, as a dynamic living person, wrestles or at least talks about this problem. You get into the Sermon on the Mount, and he's, he's in direct conversation with this problem. Jesus starts to say things in the Sermon on the Mount of, you have heard it said, 
you shall not, what? Commit adultery. But I say, if you even look at a lust, if you even look at a woman with lust in your heart, you have already committed adultery. Jesus is saying, hey, you've heard it said, Torah, Torah, Torah. But today, new thing, intimacy. That's what I want. That's what I want. So it's constantly this thread of invitation of God keeps coming to us farther and deeper to invite us into relationship with him. And to be known by him and know him is the greatest thing of all. That's what he wants for you and with you. I'll end with a couple of illustrations and then um, I'll close. God does this and shows up in Jesus and it's powerful and it's amazing. And then I'll go to two stories in a second. But one thing I just thought of actually, I'm gonna take a little tangent on, is think of the scriptures almost like a staircase, okay? Where if you think about it, every act of the play, God is kind of, kind of getting deeper or more intimate with his people. By the way, amidst rebellion and us pushing back every single time. What do I mean by that? So after the curse, you have God saying, I want to dwell with my people. So then he what? He commissions the tabernacle and the temple system so that he can dwell with them. He didn't have to do that. Did he have to do that? No, but he wanted to, his presence, he wanted to dwell with his people. Now, were they awesome or not awesome, essentially? Not awesome, right? They rebelled. It says they were stiff-necked and wicked people. What a, I never want to be called that, okay? Um, but the scripture does call us that, so we got to sit in that. <laughs> um, Stiff-necked and wicked people. God wants to be with them. And instead of them saying, oh yes, this is so awesome. God, the creator of the universe, is making a way to dwell with us again. Amidst our sin and rebellion, they still just push back, push back. They go worship false idols and the, you know, uh, you know, uh, other nations and all these different types of things. They don't honor God, his commandments, his covenants, etc. But God keeps pushing. Like, it's almost like, think of the scriptures as a, as, as a story of descent. That God is actually, like, like he, like, and another thing that does to you too is like, he's the momentum. He's the inertia. It does not have anything to do with you and what you do. It's actually about you only get to respond. You only get to respond. God is moving. God is not just, he is sitting on a throne, but I wasn't gonna say he's just sitting on the couch or something like that. He's not just sitting there vegging out. He is moving towards us. Your job is to respond, not initiate. So he's descending and you have God the Father in the temple dwelling with us for hundreds of years and they keep resisting, keep resisting, keep resisting. You would think finally at that time you would finally say, okay, never mind, peace out, I'm, I'm done. Like, I'm done. But he, what does he do? He doesn't do that. Instead, his answer, his answer to that problem of like, man, they're just wicked and rebellious is to actually always go deeper. So then the next act of the play, he shows up what? With skin on. He shows up with flesh. So he's like, I'm no longer gonna just live in this temple thing. I'm gonna become one of you. I'm gonna become one of you. And again, do you think at that point, you'd be like, yes, thank you, Lord, you're amazing. They kill him. They kill him. They crucify the Messiah, Jesus. They kill him. Kind of like, we don't want you here. And so you think, finally, once you get killed, you'd be like, I'm done, I'm out. What's he do? Next act of the play, the book of Acts. I'm going deeper. He says, I'm gonna go deeper. I'm going to not only dwell in, with skin on now, I'm going to dwell inside of them. They can't get rid of me now. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna dwell inside of them. Inside of them. So it goes God in temple, God in flesh, God inside of them. And that's not the end of the story. You get all the way down to Revelation 21 and 22, and it says that heaven and earth will be put back together and God will become our very dwelling place. So then it reverses. It's like Inception style. And we now dwell in him. That's it. Are you tracking that story? That story is insane, right? It's amazing. Thank you. Amen. It's incredible. And that's what God is inviting you to. He's inviting you to his great, grand story that he is descending towards you. He is coming after you. He is pursuing you. I love that. What is it? Psalm 23, where it says that goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Again, in the Hebrew, that's a little bit more like chase. He's not following. He is chasing. He's, you're about to get tackled <laughs> with goodness and mercy. I want to get tackled by goodness and mercy. And God's offering that. He's offering that to you right now in this place. And so I'll end with one story for time's sake. I had a couple more, but it just, it just goes on. Okay, um, uh, ADHD, anyone, can you tell? Anyways, um, so we've got a few of you, shout outs. We'll do a support group after. Uh, <laughs> Luke 24, God, Jesus dies, resurrects, okay? He resurrects, 
And then this is like the most fascinating story. It's so, I don't hear it preached on very often, but it's very interesting and fascinating. So God resurrects, Jesus resurrects, excuse me, and then it says he comes alongside these two guys. Now, they don't recognize him. I don't know if there just wasn't like Facebook profile pictures back then or what, or he changed, his, changed it a little. I don't know what's going on. They don't recognize him, but he sees they're bummed out. So he kind of says, hey guys, why are you guys bummed out? And they, they rebuke him, which by the way, never a good idea to rebuke Jesus, amen? They kind of go, they're kind of like, bro, what are you talking about? And they say, didn't you just see a couple days ago how Jesus of Nazareth, like we followed him for three years and then he just got crucified under the Roman Empire. Which by the way, even though we have all these crosses and we worship Jesus on a cross, do you realize in the first century, a man you followed that was put on a Roman execution device, you just lost and wasted three years of your life. Sit in that. You wasted three years of your life. They felt like they lost. So three years of that and they just were saying, like they don't know it's Jesus, but they're saying to Jesus, like what are you talking about? We just wasted three years of our lives. We lost. This isn't the guy. This isn't the guy. And then it says Jesus rebukes them back, which that's a good idea. You know, Jesus can rebuke us. And it says he, be, this is crazy. It says he begins from Moses all the way to the prophets beginning to describe how this had to have happened. They just weren't paying attention. Okay, do you know Moses to the prophets, by the way, is pretty much a euphemism for the whole Bible? Like they didn't have a New Testament yet. The Torah is Moses, first five books of the Bible. And outside of the wisdom literature, the prophets is pretty much everything else. It's basically him, Jesus Right when they say that, he just basically, it says Jesus opens up his Bible and goes from page one to the last page. I don't even know how long that would have taken, but it doesn't take long because they only, yeah. Anyways, opens up the whole Bible describing how this was supposed to happen. You missed it. You weren't paying attention. You weren't reading close enough, which by the way, read closely. Can we be people that read closely? Read closely, be saturated in the word, sit in the word because he's communicating to us. But here's what's crazy about that story. Jesus himself, the uppercase word, starts unpacking the entire lowercase word. And guess what? Nothing happens. Nothing happens. Like literally the next sentence is like five hours later that day. It says later that day they were going to the house. Can we just sit in how ridiculous that is? Like I would expect if Jesus is my personal Bible study partner that I would have heavens open up and there'd be people singing. Right? So many of us, we wish that. If Jesus could just show up in my room and give me all the answers, give me all the stuff, right? But you know, it's crazy, nothing happens. And then it gets even weirder. It says later that day, they go to his house or they go to their house and they ask Jesus to stay for a meal. And then it says, Jesus sits down, breaks bread with them and in an instant, their eyes were opened. That makes no sense. So over here, Jesus is unpacking the entire scriptures to them. Nothing happens. Over here, he breaks the Chick-fil-A. Ah. <laughs> that is a strange story. Can we first admit that? Unless what? Unless Jesus is trying to tell us something. Again, I think so many of us, what that is, I think it's almost too, it's like the way that we like to operate with God and the way that God wants to operate with us. See, we want to operate with God. Jesus, just give me all the answers. Give me all the answers. He says, my translation, shut up, sit with me. Be quiet and sit with me. I wanna eat with you. I wanna dine with you. Notice how they get revelation. Like maybe God's actually blocking revelation and epiphany from you because you just want the answers. You haven't sat with him. So many of us, we want, we, so another way to think about it is we almost want Jesus to give us all the answers so that we can leave him. Because when you get all the answers, who do you not need anymore? That sounds a lot like the knowledge of tree of good and evil, doesn't it? Same thing, same point. But God's saying, that's not how I operate. You can keep eating of that fruit, you can keep eating of that tree, but that's not how I operate. How I operate is I want to feast with you. I want to sit at a table with you. I want to dine with you. And now notice, they're not pitted against each other. It actually says, they say, when, it, when, when, when they have the epiphany, it says, did our hearts not burn within us as he unpacked the scriptures to us back on the path? So they go together, you get the scriptures and you get revelation by sitting at the table with Jesus. That's the invitation today. Have you sat at the table with him? Do you dine with him? Do you feast with him? I don't know what kind of stories are in this room, but it, whether it can be, you know, you're struggling with shame and guilt and pain from, you know, sleeping with your boyfriend or your girlfriend and just feeling like, ah, this doesn't feel right. It can be maybe an abortion you've had in the past. It can maybe even abortion you've scheduled in the future. It can maybe be even a level of perfection that you struggle with, but it's weighing you down because you're putting your identity in it. Whatever it is in this room, God is saying, I don't care, just sit with me. Sit with me. The goal from page one is still the same goal. I want to know you and I wanna be known by you. 
And that's the invitation, that you would taste and see that the Lord is good. And it says in 2 Corinthians, I don't know where, somewhere 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, somewhere in there. It's in, I'm gonna butcher it too, but it's essentially the summary of God saying, when we, Paul saying, when we sit at the feet of Jesus and we behold him, we actually become more and more like him and we begin to emanate ourselves. Like Moses in the Old Testament, where when he sat at the face up on the mountain, he came down glowing. Might we be people who go into our city, who go into our marriages, who go into our lives glowing because we've sat at the table with Jesus. Our world needs a lot more glowing people, does it not? More glow, more love, more gentleness, more patience, more goodness, more beauty. And so that's the invitation for you tonight, today. Wherever you're at, might we just sit at the table with Jesus? Let me pray for you. Jesus, we, um, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you're doing right now in this space and in this moment. Lord, I just pray for a room this size, there's a, a million stories going on right now, a million trajectories, people all over the map. But the best part is you just ask us to sit with you. So Lord, let us hear that invitation today that you want to feast with us. You want to dine with us. And what better invitation than getting an invitation from the king of the universe? Let us be humbled by the fact that we have even said no to that invitation and how we've lived and how we've acted and how we've spoke. Lord, we thank you for who you are. I thank you for this room. And Lord, let us just be people that say yes every day, every moment, every year.